John Lilly once put it this way, there are no limits at all to the human mind whatsoever, except those we impose on ourselves because of our beliefs. And those limits are also beliefs to be transcended. And that's a view that suggests that the possibilities of human transformation are virtually infinite. That we have no way of knowing the outer horizon of what it means to be human. And really, to understand all this, everything, you have to go very, very deep in, into uh, a study of uh, history, consciousness, neurophysiology, everything. You have, to be, you have to be the supreme eclectic type of uh, leaning, and you really have to be wanting to know who you are and, and what everything is about. The thing that you'll find when you go to sacred sites, if you're very humble about it, is that you are on a personal journey and the sacred site will respond to you in a way that is appropriate only to you. The information is always what you are searching for. And it's the intent you give uh, that energy that defines whether it is used for right action or not. And it is inside these sacred spaces that you will be reminded that you are a god, that you are a bright star. So what you're trying to do is move through the course without ricocheting off walls or creating karma. You're trying to slide through things smoothly. How do you do that? It's called flowing. There is a technique that you can do that will allow you to touch some part of your inner being that has more knowledge than your conscious state does. Now, the Atlantean conspiracy progression to major events. We'll start with 50,000 BC, but things were going on and going wrong way before that. If you remember, we talked about yesterday, 208,000 to 216 BC, as we entered, we entered the evolutionary dark cycle, because that's when D12 current could no longer anchor into the planetary grids. There was so much damage to the grids. So from then, it got worse. There are periods that um, I think we review very briefly on one chart. I think it's in this book. It was some of the more, you know, more recent data where it explains there was literally a period between, I believe, 148,000 BC and 75,000 BC where humans literally lived in subterranean civilizations because the Anunnaki races had come in in force and taken over the surface. They were literally on planet. And then there was something, I believe it's 75,000 uh, 75, BC. There was, I have the exact date in the other text where it was something called the Inner Earth Rebellion, where the races from Inner Earth opened the portals and came up because they were, the Anunnaki races were starting to go through, trying to break through the portals of Inner Earth to raid there too, to get the halls of Amente. So the uh, Guardian races literally all got together and some of the Illuminati races that didn't like the Illuminati ones that were on the surface all got together and they prevented them and they kicked the Anunnaki off the planet temporarily. So there has been this long history that goes back way longer than this. And we're just talking third seeding history. Remember, we were seeded here 550 million, no, 250 million years ago after the fall from Terra 550 million years ago. There were huge amounts of history that have to do with seeding one that culminated in the electric wars and total destruction of the races where they had to be reseeded. There's a huge history of seeding two. Some of that history is touched on in the Voyages Volume 2 book, so I won't, yeah, I don't try to incorporate it into this because it is somewhere else. But this is just seeding three history. And this is the history that'll wake up our DNA template and our tribal shield with its original D12 coding. When we start to remember this and we start to see the sequence, feel the frequency sequence and see the sequence of events. So we'll start right now with 50,000 BC after a whole bunch of other stuff took place. In 50,000 BC, there's something called the Lumerian Holocaust. Jehovian Anunnaki and their Anu Melchizedek Orantia Illuminati humans infiltrate Lumerian Marhavi 
They allow Dracos, which are Omicron Draconian plus human hybrids, all right, to infiltrate, and it culminates in the destruction of the Maravi Pacific continent. There were, what was really funny is the Jehovian Hananaki, they became the primary force here in the Lumerian areas. Now the Lumerian area, what was called Lumeria, was a continent called Marahavi that was over in the Pacific. It was small, uh, smaller than Atlantis, and it was called like the Crescent Continent because it actually shaped like a crescent. These maps we'll see before too long where the original continents were and then where they became island nations. So this was taking place in what we now call Hawaii, technically, because Hawaii is what is left of the Lemurian continent. The Jehovah Anunnaki uh, were taking over, and they allowed the Dracos to come in to try to help them, but then the Dracos tried to take them over. So the Jehovah and Anunnaki decided they wanted to be nice, and they tried to rally with the people of Atlantis and the Grey Lines and anybody they could get to help them to use the technologies to stop the Dracos. So they managed to get most of the Dracos trapped in underground tunnels. You know, there's underground tunnel systems all the way beneath the ocean floor, literally beneath the continent and you know, beneath what we call the ocean there now. <laughs> they used the crystal generators, which were massive crystal pylons, which are like, you know, building-sized crystals, and most of them are selenite, not just quartz, but selenite, because they run the frequencies better. They used those through the planetary grids, it's a scalar technology, scalar pulse technology, to try to seal them, seal the Dracos in to the, uh, the Lumerian caverns. But what happened instead was they miscalibrated and they, they blew up, literally blew up the center of the continent, its main grids, and it literally shattered some of it. It created a mess. And again, part of it went into reversal and it went into phantom. Now, phantom matrix, as we talked about yesterday, started way before any of this. The phantom matrix is what was created 250 million years ago during the, the uh, Elohim, Lear and Elohim Wars when Stargate 12, Universal Stargate 12, was originally blown up and part of this time matrix grid literally was put into a black hole subtime distortion system. So the phantom matrix has, this is where all these fallen angelics are coming from and it has a huge bearing on Earth history as well. We don't, we, they don't talk about it. In fact, they didn't introduce the concept, the full concept of phantom matrix until the most recent um, information that was given after October of last year. So we'll integrate that in as we go. But they managed to blow up the grids in um, you know, what are now the Hawaiian Islands. That was the Lumerian Holocaust. In 28,000 BC, there was something called the Atlantean Holocaust. The Syrusae, Jehovian, and Palladian, Nibiru, and Luciferian Anunnaki, and their animal, Kizidek, Illuminati humans, attempted to seize inner Earth and Atlantis, culminating in cataclysm that reduced Atlant the Atlantic continent to three island nations, Brua, Nohasa, and Lohas. They are still visible. They're just renamed. So we have no idea. We're actually, you know, part of Atlantis. Atlantis is right. So what is left of it is sitting right in front of our faces. This one, Lohas is England and Ireland, England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. They were all part of what was Lohas, Atlantis. Nohasa is now called the Bermuda Islands. Brua is what's left of the land around Sarasota, Florida, that went down into the Gulf of Mexico a little bit and down near where Cuba and those things are. These were all part once of the continent of Atlantis, and we'll show you the maps in, in a little bit. So. Same thing happened here. This story was hysterical. Each one of these has literally a story. I mean, it could be a book unto itself of how it all happened and that kind of thing. We have some of this story done, and this gets into all sorts of fighting among the Illuminati races for who is going to dominate. It has to do with Toth and Enoch heavily. And there, it, it's not in this book, because again, this is going to be in the Forbidden History book, the one that has all the detail on the history. So this happened in 28,000 BC, so that's where we ended up with the Atlantean continent becoming an island nation. 25,500 BC, there's the Luciferian Rebellion that we talked about. The Nibiru and Marduk Anunnaki, they're Anunnaki plus Omicron Draconian, that's, the, that's what Marduk Anunnaki is. They're the Anunnaki races plus, it's a hybrid, plus Omicron Draconian races. They seized control of Nibiru and the D4 Solar Gate. They began Anunnaki race unity campaign. So it was all of a sudden they were trying to bring together all of the Anunnaki races into a dominion campaign. Let's all take the Ahalos of Amente together, you know, the false unity thing. All right, now, okay. They tricked a bunch of the Atlantean Anumokizedek races into believing that they were doing a unity movement. Remind you of anything happening today? 
they tricked them into it. And they were, you know, spaceships were coming and going at that point. There's lots of visitation. And many, many, even some of the human races got tricked into the deal. They actually thought the Anunnaki were entering Emerald Covenant and it was actually going to work out. What they did was they brought in a technology that was supposed to assist in restoring the grids more quickly. Now, the Founders races and the Maji Grail lines were telling the humans and the Anunnaki Leviathan races that weren't corrupted yet, don't do this. Don't let them bring these in. It would have started Star Wars if they were tried to be, you know, if force was allowed to be used to stop them. If the Founders came in or, you know, sent some of their troops in with spaceships, they would have had Star Wars and the place would have rolled again. So it, that kind of intervention wasn't an option at that time. <laughs> this is where humanity is living a part of its karma because it allowed something to take place. It allowed a technology to be brought here that involved more pylon crystals, big ones that are like, you, look, you think of the Empire State Building, the size of that. Well, there were many pylon crystals that size and some of them bigger. These were massive instruments of running frequency and running scalar frequency. Well, they brought them in and they put a grid here and they put a grid in parallel Earth on coordinate locations. Where they put this grid was that the, uh, there's a, a frequency line or a, a ley line that runs between Q-side 11, that is in Ireland, and Stargate 11, that is in England. They put this right in the middle of that line so it could supposedly begin to draw energy from Stargate 11 to supposedly give them more power for their technologies. What it did was right at that point begin to reverse any currents that would come through Stargate 11 or through Q-site 11. So it would make Stargate 11, once it activated in a stellar activation cycle, it would make it um, activate on a reverse current, which would mean all the others would begin to spiral in reverse, which means the whole thing would get, the whole planet, the Merkaba would completely reverse and the planet would get taken down into the Phantom Matrix. This was the real reason they brought their nice technologies in and wanted to do a unity movement. So, yeah, nice people. Uh, so, these guys, um, down here. During this period, there's a major period of setback for the Guardian races because right here was the stellar activation cycle they were all aiming for. That was the next one. Uh, there was one around 75,000 BC when they had the, the inner Earth uh, rebellion and all that kind of stuff. Every time a Stargate cycle was due, it was war. Every time here. The ones that got passed over at least were more peaceful, where the planet actually couldn't hold a stellar bridge grounding. But the ones that had any potential of having the gates open, it was always the fallen angelics raided trying to get a hold of a mente. So I think there was a, I'm not sure I'd have to do the math. There was, I know there was one that was tried, or a stellar activation cycle was going to go down in 75,000 something or other BC, but that got all hung up in the inner Earth rebellion protecting the planet from you know, Anunnaki literally having had it at the surface for a long time. So these guys here were aiming for this time period. They were getting this grid installed. It was called the Nibiruan Dyotic Crystal Grid. It was a, se a series of 12 major pylons. 12 were put here and 12 were put on parallel Earth. And they were, what, <laughs> what the people here didn't know is that these were being linked frequency-wise. There was a link being made to the planet Nibiru through something called the Battlestar Nibiru, which was called Wormwood in the Bible. All right, the Battlestar Nibiru isn't a planet. It's a piece of a planet that was captured in Nibiru in orbit by the technologies they have, and it was turned into, literally, a battle planet. We're inside of it. It's like living quarters. It's like, like a, a little, um, it's like a, a planet, but on the inside of itself. So it's a, an artificially constructed thing, and it's bigger than Earth is. Nibiru is bigger than Earth is. There was this very, very elaborate setup of, t of technology done in order to let this Nibiru and grid work. They literally had to. Nibiru was already in an elliptical orbit, and it already had the battle star. That had been done in seeding two. That was a mess that was left over from seeding two. What they were able to do was they were able to connect the battle star into this grid and progressively reverse part of Earth's Merkaba and make an artificial Merkaba link from the Earth's grid up through the solar gate that they had control of through reversing part of the solar Merkaba into the Wormwood uh, Battlestar Nibiru and then into the Nibiruan matrix, the planetary matrix. Very, very sophisticated technology. And this is how they initially got full control over our planetary grids. At that point, if you block Universal Stargate 4, 
you can't get any information from the higher levels in because it all goes through that distortion matrix and gets intercepted. So this became a point where it was becoming very difficult for the founder's races to have direct intervention without pushing it into complete founder's war again, where you'd have, you know, ships and Merkabas flying all over the place and light balls cruising through the universe and whoever was left when, you know, it was over with. It, and that, could, that, when that, those things happen, they have the potential to literally take this whole time matrix down. So that type of activity on, on the part of the founders, they will allow a lot of pushing to happen before they make a stand that would literally push back in that way because they know that if there's any possible way of peaceful resolution, they will always take that way because they know every time those kind of wars are fought that it takes a chance of literally taking the whole matrix down. So they won't, it takes dire circumstances before that kind of stand would even be made. Hey guys, welcome. Andre Hodge, Summon of Truth, Infinite Potential Healing with you once more. Thank you for finding me. It's an honor and privilege for me to be a part of your journey and I aim to make that investment of your precious time a very beneficial one to you. So I appreciate you allowing me to be a part of your journey and to consider what I offer and stuff. So I hope that you've gained a lot from whatever you've explored in the past. I've got to do this a bit quick because bit quick, it's a bit late in the day and we're in the shortest time of the year down Southern Hemisphere and stuff. Um, I've been brewing this for a while, a lot of components, um, a lot of experiences as well. And I'm probably going to do this a bit light, a bit short, with not much investigation into the parts because I'll do that later to give more data. Um, but. I was deciding whether to, to include this in the recalibration of our new energetic reality part two or multi-dimensional method to the 3D madness, which is what I'm really about, which I'll aim to uh, uh, offer some clarity about 
my perspective of where I come from um, or just the whatever but what I'm thinking of doing is making this one an expansion of the Amplify the Echoes of Our Souls Ancient Truth because the overall theme with that is the bigger war right? long time war so um, if I was going to do a recalibration one I'd do a bit more entry but I'm thinking of this this part um, will fit in to what I've been offering and all that and I'll add some clarity about my angles of what I've said because I've shared data with the aim to seed um, your algorithm of per perception so what I want to do is just say that <clears throat> what I've worked out um, and it's fire experience what I'm going to call chaos 19 all right because I went through many videos and explorations and stuff. I went through, I'm, I'm, it was a bit before my time, but the band KLF, there was a documentary that came out recently called Who Killed the KLF? And it was really fascinating. There's a concept called Discordianism and what they were doing. They were trying to, trying to disrupt the music industry and insert chaos to destabilize it. And I think that's been flipped on us and it's been used against us. So I don't know if I'll include it in this because it might be a bit too long with all the clips I'm intending to offer. Um, I went through a TV series called Enterprise, Star Trek Enterprise, because I, I went through a lot last couple of months, and the last video I showed, I'll just offer this, like I've had my unicorn hair doing missions indicating that I've been taken outside of time and stuff, and I'm pretty sure last week when I did that passion show, I'd done that, I'd done grid work, I'd been doing sessions, and I don't get a lot of sessions if you think I earn a lot and stuff. I, I get enough to get by. And, um, but I had some brewing as well. Some people were interfered with and stuff, and I was in Chaos 19. I actually, I've actually been through COVID, right? And it was a very interesting scenario. It's amongst it was after I worked out the sabotage thing which me, which I clubbered the universe and reset my universe and what's appropriate and stuff. Um, I've had agents of chaos with stuff inserted in them, insert shit in me and stuff. So, um, and the overall theme is that we're all sort of potentially victims of sabotage, but as I said in... Um, Emotional pastry part four, it's society rewards victim and the victim state you've got to watch out for because it opens your field up and all that sort of stuff. So it's a pattern of the indigos and the guardians and the founder beings, what we've all been through, all right? So I offered a bit of a clip, my intent, um, going into my morning. I revisited some of the Usher stuff and I'm, I'd probably included like a 14 or 15 minute clip just to expand on the um, uh, the the bigger scales 250 billion years sort of stuff have gone on and I think we all feel like we're just a bit over it okay and we're done with it and we want it to end and we thought we could relax and then it's game on again so it's it's like we're in the um, the potentially a lot of the shock that we realize we're in that and we've got to get ourselves up to speed or whatever you know what I mean so uh, I've I use me as a metaphor and stuff so to show where I fit in and what I've been involved in and stuff so um, what I'll show is an image quick this is a bigger scale image sort of thing of the overall scale of things so what I've just done is, so there's Chaos 19, all right? And I've gone through a lot of videos. I've said I've done extensive research and stuff. And I was actually in, intending to do a show, this particular re release called There's No Shortcut to Self Mastery. Um, it was meant to be the third along the lines of the leadership with uh, Marcus Aurelius and then the Passion Show last weekend. So I went into that Passion Show doing missions, grid work, I actually did like 10 k's of walking, hour of gym, weights and sauna on top because if I get beaten up, I go harder and stuff. So the passion is 
the thing that links me to all the information. It's the uh, the frequency that I can connect the dots. And so I haven't finished that passion show. It was important to get out that you can have a fire in inside yourself that can spark your genius, all right? Don't be defined by anyone else or what anyone else thinks, all right? So, um, and you don't need an external passive mode to trigger it. You can engage it at all times. That's why I say about Michael Jordan and the last dance mysticism sort of thing that he operates in. And apologies to anyone that I caused trauma about what Michael Jordan's done to your team in the 90s. I realize that. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just getting to this quick because the light's going to run out quick. So so then there's there's been this plan for Chaos 19, which I'm going to call it for a long time, all right? And so the way I see it with the bigger scales relative to what I've offered, relative to um, the Ashiana sort of stuff, is there was this cycle called the stellar activation cycle that was going to happen. No one ever, ever really knew when it was, and it kicked in, and then all the negative species aligned to want to extend and take over control. And I think we're in a stalemate again, but we're in occupation because 25,000 years ago we got... Uh, invaded and that succeeded so we've been in that occupation that's why it's been so fucked since all right part of my language but yeah so to so say chaos 19 is an aspect of that so there was all this breeding sort of stuff to get the codes and all that sort of stuff going on right and then it was planned to be implemented once that was done to shut us down okay and this is what this show was about because i realized all this going through all this stuff right it's all the stuff related to chaos 19 is going after our prefrontal cortex and i might show all the videos in this or i might just do this as an entry because i don't want it to be too long it's going to be quite complicated and so this is going to be quite light but i'm probably going to show you images relative to the prefrontal cortex in different places and stuff and have that there because if you see it, it regulates a lot of the body, but it's also related to intuition. And there's a really interesting clip that I don't know if I'll clip, include in this particular video. I might include it in the next one. Because again, I said I'm not intending to make this too long. Um, and I'm going to have a few clips here and there. Okay. To so say the big overall scale, what I'm getting is, say Ashiana went hardcore and did all her stuff from late 90s to i'm just going to say there's a there was something happened in 2012 and a lot of people are like fuel bad shit happened all right but you got to understand my experience of being in the field out there all right there's frackery all the time all right and if you're looking for the wrong in the right and looking for fallouts and all that sort of shit as a justification to not explore then you're denying yourself all right because the way you should interpret it is confirmation, all right? And what they achieved in all that, all right? <clears throat> 2002 to, you know, 12 and the enormous volume of stuff that they released at a high level that, you know, I, I, I'm re removing the, the pure humbleness of me to offer what I've done because no one's really asked or even wanted to go there, but... I've done a lot, all right? And I've done a lot of high-level sort of stuff, all sorts of stuff. I've done so much crap as well, all right? To find the nuggets of gold wisdom that I offered, say, in my Conscious Explorer series and stuff, you have to really comprehend of how much I've actually gone through to, to find those things and put them on a plate for people, all right? So tens of thousands of work, hours of exploration, repeatedly going over stuff because you can miss stuff first time. So... Those of you that are relentless and go through things 10 or 15 times and keep finding stuff, good on you, all right? It's what's needed, unfortunately. Um, it goes into your cellular memory, but being the conscious awareness, it's awareness training, like muscle training, all right? So she went through all this stuff, and then there was potentially a fallout in 2012, all right? She's still going and doing her stuff, and there was really epic one released last year, November, all right? So I've got this... That line there, with the GSF, that's saying me and my journey, all right? So I went through awakening and stuff. I was very clueless and stuff. And then so I met Nikki Thetsi. Uh, she birthed the 5D Earth. 
uh, July 2013 and stuff. So I've been working with her. But what, what uh, there's stuff in those Galactic Special Forces missions which I didn't include. But long story short, we were doing that to prevent a pole flip. All right. Okay. So if you've listened to Ashiana, it's all about pole flips and stuff like that, alright? So we were doing Bank of England, Vatican, all sorts of stuff, off-world. Uh, she was travelling around, I'd gone bankrupt so I lost my passport. I know if you watch the TV show Travellers, my currency trading was meant to source the money and stuff. And I worked out the potential for me it was doing that I could earn. 38 million dollars and have the cash that's the number I get it's crazy but I made nine times nine times my money in three months from 2010 to about April 2011 and then all this other stuff happened and I was just I was exhausted I recovered from hospital and all this sort of stuff and uh, I in other videos I talked about got involved with Santos Bonacci and this guy around him was doing hypnosis people around me I was being smashed and I was able to push through and yeah, got bankrupt in twenty early twenty twelve. So it was very tough but uh still doing all these missions, living on one and a half meals a day sort of stuff, right? So despite all that and I had I had these people into Keylonic science trying to get to me and stuff and I was blocked and I realised I know the mechanics because I got entangled with sort of different frequencies of beings and the reality is the majority here are entangled with the Phantom Matrix, all right? They don't know it. Most people wouldn't own up to it. Most people wouldn't reflect and, and drop what they're doing to change. Um, that's where I've included that clip related to Ram Dass talking about um, a quote from Gandhi saying, reduce yourself to zero and your power becomes infinite. When you have nothing, you're very flexible. So that's the... That's the freedom I gained from doing all, going through what I've gained, gone through to be purely focused on whatever outcome it is and the best for humanity and stuff. And so everything I've been involved in has to a degree been very naive. So the second line is where I got involved with sort of other teachers and almost got smashed early 2020 with all this stuff going on. So maybe they're a bit out of scale and timing wise and stuff. I did this really quick. But what I'll say is that was keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. And I was sort of with that, all right? So the outcome is how it is. And I was naive and I was trusting and all that sort of stuff. And I thought we were all on the same side. What what the data I've said in this series is to give you data points for the war that was going on. So a lot of people think, you can think I'm traumatized and stuff like that, right? But I've been engaged in this from the get-go, right? And maybe you have too. And what I'm inviting you, I'm going to include a clip a bit later, a cool clip from Itzhak Bentoff. Um... I'm inviting you to think multidimensional and the strategy to smash us, all right? When a lot of the teachers out there are aligned with the opposition and their aim is to hijack us and prevent us and do it in a free will way sort of thing. So it's very complex and technical, but I've, what I'm going to say is I've never done any recordings related to the World Economic Forum and stuff and Anunnaki and all that sort of stuff and all the species that Ashiana talks about they should be obvious right? that stuff going on in the Middle East Amicron Draconian and Anunnaki and all that going against each other for the strategic locations and stuff should have been included but the omission is interesting okay so yeah that's an interesting image and what I'm getting to is the Chaos 19, all right? This is what it's about, going after our prefrontal cortex and intuitive sort of stuff, all right? So I'm calling it Chaos 19 for a deliberate reason, okay, as well, which we'll get into. So I'm just, it's getting dark already, Dan. But um, I'm going to show you another image. So this is like intuitive perception and stuff. So a lot of people go, one side is what you know and one side is all there is, alright? 
So a lot, most people go with what they know and what they get this small algorithm. What I'm inviting you, what I'm inviting you to do is do what I do, right? Know that what you know, right? But there's vastness out there of what you don't know. And what I do is I get the algorithm going because I'm open to what I don't know. And when I employ what I know, and it doesn't add up, the mechanics of all the data you invest, all right? So there's no shortcuts to self-mastery, all right? Um, it can help the algorithm of perception, all right? So this video for me is including including a lot of experiences to put all the puzzle pieces together, all right? So I'm just inviting you to contemplate the same, all right? Because the majority of people go with what they know and they, they judge everything by that and then they project about that. So what I'm saying about me and data and information I've included in this series, all right? Don't go purely 3D, see it as war. See, is there's a bigger scale I'm trying to introduce you to and the data points relative to that and the hits and the interference and all that, okay? So contemplate that. So don't be limited by what you know. Include what is out there, all right? Get those muscles going, okay? So um, I'm going to be a bit quick because I've probably only got about 10 minutes of talking before it's really dark. So what I want to do is... Over all this last couple months, right? Um, and I'll get into the specifics of Chaos 19 at another point, but um, the focus is on the prefrontal cortex, right? And so what I'm going to do is include a clip from the TV show Enterprise here. Hopefully I can get it through the um, censorship, um, copywriting sort of thing. But I revisited that show because I wanted to go back to different eras. And the 90s, 2000, and that, like that series is a bit light, and there's good values and stuff, right? So I was recalibrating to all that, and it was interesting. There's a really cool episode. It's in the second series, second season, episode nine, called Singularity, where they, ironically, are going to explore and do scientific measurements on a black hole with a couple of um, something. I, I forget the names of it, but. Long story short, um, the frequencies and the radiation given off, it affects the crew in their prefrontal cortex. What happens is they all go obsessive and um, it's, it's, a, it's pretty much the funniest, like coolest episode in the whole series almost. But there's this gradual escalation of craziness and obsession, all right? And it's a really good clip relative to the metaphor of Chaos 19 and what it does, right? Because that um, prefrontal cortex is a bit like the metaphor I've got is sonar relative to dolphins and whales. And what I realized going through it, um, and the way it works, like the medicine that we're, the medicines have been banned, all right, that can take care of it. So there's a, there's a desire for it to gestate in the community, all right? So I'll just show you this clip. And hopefully it won't get copyrighted and you can be on the other side. And I'm going to be pretty quick. Hey, this is Andre coming the next day. i am just been going through my video and trying to um, make sure I don't uh, breach any copyright sort of things. And unfortunately the clip with the Star Trek... Uh, episode of Enterprise called Singularity. Um, like most of the Star Trek stuff, that's pretty heavily um, prevented from being used. So unfortunately I can't uh, include the clips on here on YouTube, but I will be doing an unedited version that I'll put onto my bit sheet, which will be a bit more complete because I really wish I could show you that. It would be awesome, but <clears throat> it's not worth preventing what the main message is here to get out. So um, what I'll just do is I'll just do a bit of commentary because what, what happened is um, they come across a star cluster and black hole, which is ironic, right? a trinary system that they call it. And um, 
because they're an explorer aspect. Um, the Vulcan member of the crew, Tapol, um, wanted to go and explore it and measure it. What what eventually unfolded during the episode <coughs> is there was a radiation given off that really affected the crew. Gradually, it it simmered and it brewed up, and um, it affected their prefrontal cortex, which is very interesting. All right. Because the metaphor here is it's a teaching of that region of the brain and what it does. And so um, what happened in the crew is they gradually simmered simmered and got uh, more insane and sane and sane and sane. And they they became less aware of those around us and very compact um, and singular on their own agendas. All right? So it's very, very interesting. It's like a disconnect went on and an amplification of um, whatever they had going on. Like there was a crew member, the the en main engineer that the captain asked for a bit of help with the seat on the f on the flight deck, and he didn't he didn't give a crap. It was like such a low level task at the beginning, and then he just got it, got more intense, more intense. He made it like instead of like. Um, <laughs> Just doing something simple to fix what the captain wanted. He made it like a throne with armrests and drink holders, and he was trying to get ca like color coded headrests and all of this stuff and inertial damplers. So if the craft was going through a lot of crap, it would, he wouldn't feel anything and stuff. And long story short, with that at the end, um, when everything became resolved and the energy was a lot better. What he what he worked out. All he needed to do was raise, like, lower the seat one centimeter to suit the captain's needs. It was really very poetic and done. But um, yeah, it was very very interesting teaching for me when I saw it relative to the variables of all the things going on. And it's a great metaphor. So um, perhaps look out for the link below to my BitChu channel when I upload it and stuff. And it, the sort of unedited version so um yeah it was really interesting as well for the different species like uh, the doctor is a different species and um his obsession with one of the crew members relative to a headache he wanted to do brain surgery and stuff and um the ironic aspect of that is he collected the data to help uh to pull the the vulcan member to um find a solution and get through the star system uh, but she had to get someone's help to fly the craft and got the captain so yeah it was a great great episode of a great series so I highly recommend it if you want to find something to ground in this crazy white world and stuff um, great values and stuff so I'll get back to the main video and I'll see you after So I hope you enjoyed that, all right? So then the other layer is, um, as I said, the multi-deeming, the 3D. And I've offered information in this series that might have you polarized and I've got trauma relative to the 3D. But what I'm trying to invite you and use me as a metaphor is to take it to the multi-D. And you sort of can't give high-level beings the benefit of the doubt. You have to actually be courageous and realize, holy fuck, it's strategy. And we're just like playing catch up, all right? So this next clip I want to do is relative to Itzhak Bentoff. And it's the evolution of con consciousness sort of thing. So the Chaos 19 sort of thing is, in my opinion, an effort to hinder that, all right? So I'll just show you this because it's, it's not as dark, but say he's got this sort of image that he has all right and what I'm offering is um, chaos 19 is trying to stamp down that potential of the high level sort of stuff all right so what I'll do is I'll just show you the clip I, it's a, it's not too long it's really cool I've uh, got a better quality than the one on my channel so just see it and go through it and see the other side because it's actually I've actually included an extra bit which is really cool. All right.
what is it that is evolving? Now, you talked about the nervous system evolving, right? But yeah. is there something else that is evolving that is able to be sensitive to this higher level of reality? We have this notion of the soul. You know? Most people uh, weren't talking about the soul. It's a kind of non-physical thing, highly theoretical. And so when you go to church, you take this soul out of the closet and polish it up a little bit, and then you go to church and you have one <laughs> way with your soul. Then you come back and put it back in the closet till next week. So uh, that's about the idea of a normal person, the soul. But actually, that's not the case. I mean, we don't have souls, but it's just the other way around. The soul has us. Mm. Mm. So that is that thing that evolves, the permanent, eternal thing, is the soul, and the body is a kind of disposable thing. Uh -huh. That is, you know, you, you use a body uh, like a car for 80,000 miles, 100,000 miles, <laughs> and you chunk it, and that's it, you get another one. So, it's the, the driver is the soul, who, who uses the body for a while, and then he runs it into the ground, and he gets another one sooner or later. And, and so it's the soul which is experiencing evolution. And not our personality, not our physical yeah. uh, existences. That is, the soul is the repository of information that we gather during a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, maybe we should draw another diagram. Mm -hmm. Physical bodies are here, and another physical body, another physical body, and this is Joe, and this is Jim, and this is Sarah, etc. Uh -huh. Now, clearly, on the phys this is the physical level, yeah? Now, on this physical level, we are separate. You sit there, and I sit here, and we're all separate. Now let's draw another level. This level is, is slightly higher, and let's call this the level of the soul, yeah? Well, there will be some mingling here. Let's, let's draw this person as extending to practically infinity this way. Now look what happens. At the physical level, we are separate. We are separate, and there's this much distance between mm -hmm. us. Let's say that on the soul level, this person extends this much, and the other person gets slightly mixed in with him. That is, the souls are, in a way, in touch with each other. Okay, they overlap, these two lines. Now, let's go now to a higher level, and let's call this, uh, say, the level of the higher self, which is kind of a boss of that soul. Mm -hmm. uh, there, what we find is that this fellow's higher self extends this much, and the other fellow extends this much. Mm -hmm. There is more overlap between them. Right. On the very highest level, which is the high spiritual level, we are basically overlapping completely. Everybody is overlapping everybody else. In other words, everything and Everyone is everywhere. In other words, we've become omnipresent. This is a state of highly spiritual perfected beings, or gods, you may call them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, and so that we exist on all of those simultaneously. On all of those simultaneously, so but then, uh, we're not in, aware of that. In, in, in your view, then, if we, when we see each other as separate entities, that's only seen on one plane of reality. Correct. And so whether we like it or not, we're all evolving towards godhood. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it takes eons, so don't hold your breath. Is that the purpose of evolution? Naturally. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, you start understanding how the system works. And one of the good things about the system is that the system wants to teach you about itself. Mm -hmm. What does it's it want to teach you? It's a good system. Yeah? Yeah. What does it want to teach you? Well, if you are, if you are omnipresent and you're all-knowing, that is the state which the system wants you to be in. Mm -hmm. Because the system is an intelligence or information gathering system. Mm -hmm. so and it's all of also freely distributing that information. Our next subject will be a very important principle, the hologram, which is uh, the basis of reality as Ben perceived it. 
And as usual, Ben had some interesting diagrams to explain his ideas, and he explained the hologram in terms of um, three pebbles being dropped into a pizza pan filled with water. And you drop these pebbles simultaneously into the water. What happens? Each pebble announces what happens to it. In fact, it, it's screaming, help, I'm drowning in a pizza pan. So it sends out these wavelets that reach every point on the surface of this water. And every pebble does that. So uh, if we take this water now, which, uh, re which resulted in a uh, pattern of wavelets that now clash into one another, all this information about the pebbles, and it's called the interference pattern in cross-section. It would look like that. And if you quick freeze the water and you get a piece of ice like this, which is actually a photograph of all the information about these pebbles. And then you take what is known as coherent light or light where all the rays are of the same frequency, uh, a laser light, and you shine it through this interference pattern Lo and behold, you see the three pebbles reconstructed three-dimensionally in space. This is the important part of the hologram, that all the information is contained in this pattern, and every point of this pattern contains that information. Because if by mistake you break this piece of ice, and you end up with a little sliver of it, and you shine the same light through it, you will still get your three pebbles. So this method of storing information is the most efficient way that nature has devised. And uh, so Ben was a great believer and observer of the phenomenon of the um, uh, relationship between the micro level and the macro level. When nature comes up with a method that really works, then it will be repeated on all these different levels. And we see more of that later. This is an actual photograph, if you can see it, of waves interacting with each other, creating this moiré pattern of waves. It will actually look something like that. And here, if you shine this coherent light, the three-dimensional object gets reconstructed. Now, if instead of those three pebbles, we substitute three individuals, because we, like the pebbles, are constantly sending out information about ourselves in a variety of ways. And all these fields are interacting, creating a hologram, an interference pattern. And you could say that human consciousness is one big hologram of information about humanity as a whole. We are one mind, one consciousness. And of course, the implications of this are stupendous because uh, if we realize there, that everything that we do, that we think, affects not only us, but everyone else, and not only everyone else in humanity, but it also goes beyond the boundaries of our planet. And another way of looking at this would be to see these three pebbles or three separate individuals who feel themselves so isolated on this physical level. But if these uh, lines here indicate uh, ever-widening consciousness, we notice that on these higher levels, we begin to interact. So these two are interacting here, these two here, but all three are interacting on the next level. And if you visualize humanity being composed of these separate dots and billions of us, then on the highest level, we are all interacting and we are all one. And of course, you can look at it in reverse, that here is human consciousness, all one, and it sort of percolates down or dribbles down into these separate units, and we all think that we are so separate. And as we interact, we entrain each other. As we saw before, there is a principle of resonance and of entrainment or rhythm communication. In other words, a consciousness that has done its homework. This is a teacher, a guru, 
who has advanced somewhat beyond the others, then his energy, his consciousness will be more coherent, it will be more harmonious, and like those oscillators that we looked at, it will entrain and pull after itself consciousnesses that are less evolved. Welcome back. So I hope you enjoy that. It's pretty cool, hey? So you see what I'm talking about. You know, the evolution of consciousness is a natural thing. Right? So say, at the bigger scales and stuff. Alright? And if you go through the back, it, the other aspects of this series, alright? If I show you the other image. So if you go through the uh, like the Babylon Massacre, the Ayani Massacre, the Leviathan, um, Atlantean Conspiracy and all that sort of stuff that had been in the prior episodes of the series, we're all known what's going to happen. It's all been predicted. It's also been known that on the other end of the stellar activation cycle it was time for clean up and change, right? So, so the World Economic Forum got formed in the 1970s and so it's been brewing for all this sort of stuff for 40 years, right? As I said, I've never talked about it, never had conversations about it. <clears throat> I've never brought it up because it's putting all the dots together. It's it's like when you there's a cool TV series out there from 2009 called Flash Forward, all right, where they all have a minute, like 134 seconds, I think, of seeing their future six months ahead of time. The whole world doing the scientific experiment triggered it, all right, and so the future was so weird compared to the present but no one knew what was going on but then uh, the future married with the present and everything made sense but when you see the future you don't have the context right but what I'm inviting is what was going to happen was always known right and these were all planned okay and so I've shown other images as well, and I might overlay it. Um, of like the whole 1900, they knew that we were going to bubble up. They created all the 2012 movement and all the UFOs and all that sort of crap to hijack the stellar activation cycle awareness, and are still getting through it to be aware of it. Right? And so they needed us, our codes. Lots of breeding was going on to get us, to get the DNA and all that sort of stuff to recognize it, all right? And so they created stuff to put in us to target the prefrontal cortex, all right? So depending how long this is, I might show this video now. And it's from a video, I may show this on YouTube, I may not, I may only show this on um, BitChute, we'll see how it goes, all right? What I came, what I known is probably many of you came across a video about targeting the spiritual thing versus like doing stuff medication wise to limit that in a region of the world. That my attitude is, it was taken and recognised that, hello, we can do this to humanity, all right. So I'm not really going to get into the information relative to COVID. Uh, I'm, I'm not really going to explain my experience with it right now what I'm really wanting to do is invite you to really contemplate the prefrontal cortex alright so I'll show you this video and we'll see you on the other side because it's getting quite dark excuse me on the left over here we have individuals who are religious fun fundamentalists religious fanatics and this is the expression, uh, RT-PCR, real-time PCR uh, expression of the VMAT2 gene. Over here, Dr. we have Hello. individuals. Hello. So, so, so let, let me complete. So over here, we have uh, individuals who are not particularly uh, fundamentalists, not particularly religious. And you can see there's a, a much reduced uh, expression of, of this particular gene, the, the VMAT2 uh, gene. 
uh, another evidence that, that supports our, our hypothesis for the development of, of, of this um, approach. Uh, so what you, what you see here is by, by, by spreading this virus, we're going to eliminate individuals from donning on a bomb vest and going into a market and blowing up the market. So our, our hypothesis is that these are fanatical people, uh, that they have overexpression of the VMAT2 gene and that by vaccinating them against this, will eliminate this behavior. Uh, so we have some, some very, very uh, remarkable data in this next slide. Uh, here we have two uh, brain scans. These are fMRIs. Uh, these are two different individuals with different levels of expression of VMAT2. Uh, on top uh, is an individual who's a religious fanatic and individual, and we've repeated this numerous times, that, that uh, has uh, high levels of VMAT2. Now, um, this individual down here who had low levels of the VMAT2 gene, this individual would uh, self-describe as, as, as not particularly religious. In, in each case, uh, these individuals were, were read a religious text. Uh, this individual uh, light lit up um, this, the right middle frontal gyrus uh, shown here, and uh, that's a part of the brain that's associated with theory of mind. Uh, it's a part of the brain that, that uh, has to do with intents and, and beliefs and, and desires. Uh, in contrast, in marked contrast, here's an individual who would uh, not particularly uh, self-describe as, as religious. And when they're read a religious text, <clears throat> what you see is that this part of the brain called the anterior insula lights up. This is a part of the brain that's associated with, with disgust or displeasure on hearing something. Uh, so you're suggesting I take a CT scan with me when I'm uh, evaluating people to determine whether I put a bullet in their head? So, so um, the, the data that I'm presenting here uh, supports uh, the, the concept that, that we're proposing. Uh, and I think that uh, we would not propose to do uh, CT scans or fMRIs on, on individuals out in the hinterlands of, of Afghanistan. The virus would immunize against this VMAT2 gene, and that would, would have the effect that you see here, which is it's essentially to turn a fanatic into a, a, a normal person. And we think that will have major effects in the Middle East. How would you suggest that this is going to be dispersed, the aerosol? Well, so, so the, the present uh, plan and the tests that we've done so far um, have used uh, uh, respiratory viruses, uh, such as flu or or uh, rhinoviruses, and uh, we believe that that's a satisfactory way to get the exposure of the largest uh, part of the population. Most of us, of course, have, ha have been exposed to both of those viruses, and, and we're, we're quite confident that, that this will be a, a, a very successful uh, approach. This is fascinating. What's the name of this proposal? Yeah, so, so the name of this project is FunVax, which is the vaccine for religious fundamentalism. And you have a proposal already? The proposal uh, has just been submitted. And I think that the data that I have shown you today would, would support uh, the, the development of, of this project. And we think it has great promise. Hey, guys. Andre Hodge back here after that very interesting clip and what I've thought I will do is the very next day I'll do a finish off of this video. Uh, I'm happy with what I did, but I thought I could do better. So, so what I've sort of introduced is <clears throat> Chaos 19 and seemingly open barn door of things going on. We're all wanting to chill out and rest and relax, um, but then there's been something big on a grand scale that's been occurring that we're all sort of set up for failure and stuff. So the date of that video is 2005, right? So it was aimed for a particular area of the world, but um, quite ironic what it can do and stuff, if that makes sense, all right? So it's in that region of the brain. The images I've got are relative to, if you're very technical out there, it's perhaps a bit different, but my advice is 
Um, the awareness of how the brain works relative to Moldy D is really not known, okay? <clears throat> and um, it's very interesting because from when I was born, I was going through all these studies every three or four years, and one of them was a stress test, measuring all my brain, putting me in scenarios to test my way to get through things, and testing, I'm right-handed, testing my left hand doing this mechanical task where this is my right hand, but I had to go through this star, and I had electrode, it had a shock on it, and the the view was blocked, but I'm doing my right hand because I'm holding the phone with my left, but it was blocked. I had this mirror, so it was reversed, and I had to go around. Not If I went off the edge with the electrode, I got a shock, and I, I've never used my left hand like that. I've never done anything like that, but what happened, it kicked the gear in, and they were measuring all my brain waves, obviously testing the right brain and all this sort of stuff, so it's... Um, I was going to go through the Val Valerian um, video because I know that's out there, but um, that interview, if you go out there and look for him, it was from 1992 in the Matrix books, so really earlier on than that, all right? So the reason why I just dropped that is who we are and what we can do has been known for a very, very long time, just because it's not out there in the awareness and with all the information we have it doesn't mean it isn't known so that was 30 years ago and those books are you know still more advanced than most can handle now right so um yeah it's very very interesting because what i'll drop here is when i said in the last couple of videos that um my attitude is we have all our senses going all the time. It's the interpretation that's not there. So it's sort of confirmation of me going through this experience um, was how it felt. And like when I was, you know, going through my unawareness very early on in my teens and stuff working at Burger King, as I said, I made a lot of whoppers in the last video to, to fund my record collection expansion. Um, when I reflect on who I was then and how I operated, I had a lot of components to um, aspects of, say, multidimensional um, talents and stuff. Just they were innate in me, and I operated instinctively without the appreciation of the mechanics of what I was doing. It was just like we're in ourselves, all right, and we do what we do without understanding the the mechanics of it and we think we're all the same but we're not all right and so when i went through this experience of the um what was going on in that region and i'm i'm trying not to be too long in detail there'll be other times for that um the absence of that connection was there all right it's subtle and it's distorted all right so what i'm getting to is it felt like <clears throat> the metaphor is if you're a whale or a dolphin and a lot of us have affinities to them and I've had experiences surfing down the place where my mate wanted to buy land and stuff. Um, 2011, when my mum had cataract surgery, I went down there and saw whales jump out of the water, humpback whales and stuff. It was pretty epic. And I've surfed with dolphins and stuff going underneath me and that, so, um, which is amazing in itself, right? But yeah, we all sort of have an affinity to um, those sort of sea mammals and stuff. I'm sure you do, right? I've done recordings with them in the past with a lot of passion. And so if you go back to the Babylon massacre where we're being disconnected and our technologies are being reduced to from 12 strand and living 800 to 1,000 year lives or eternal to these mortal 65, 75, 80, 90 year old lives with a very limited DNA strand, right? Perhaps that's an aspect of our nature that we've always had that's in the background and there's no um, instruct human body instruction book that we understand. What I'm just offering is if I show you a, an image. So I, I showed this Itzhak Bentoff metaphor of his mechanics of relative to a expansion of consciousness and stuff. And what I'm saying is um, the Chaos 19 is like a level that's put in there to distort, okay, to push back and stuff. So 
people that are unawareness that might be coming into it, they can actually be affected by it, right? And the majority of humanity are like that, right? Most people um, do have talents, but they're just um, passive. If you remember in the Passion Show, I talked about passive and active employment and stuff. So when you're aware, you can amplify them and stuff, right? So I'm going to expand on that with this information of that video that I just showed, right? <coughs> this is an expansion of that, right? So say, we know people, we possibly have family members and stuff that have had it, and we're in culture and society, and we all might be sensitive to our regions, cities, locations where we go, worldwide and stuff. As I said, Earth is a small place, right? So if you look, I've drawn a line across the 3D sort of thing. And then I've got this multi d thing, and that, that's meant to be an arrow that expands. Let's say down the bottom it's thin, up the top it's fat, right? And the fatness is the degree of resistance. So the higher you go, the more resistance you get, metaphor. And if you look at back at the influences show and um, amplify the echoes part five when I talked about the narrative and stuff, and when you go deeper down the narrative, um, influence pop up right so i've done a couple of light videos and i'm doing a bit more detailed right let's say on this all right see that darker line is say you in the middle right so as as the higher levels of overlap of consciousness right in a collective state okay um you've got people around you and you overlap at a lower level right that have got Chaos 19 going in them, right? And I'm just saying it, Chaos 19, because it distorts the frequency and stuff, because this is all frequency, reality and stuff, right? So what do you think that vibration of stuff go, does at a higher level, right? A lot of people pick it up, and they get um, affected by it, right? And then what happens with the higher level overlap when we're in collecting, say, right? So, you see, um, as I've shown in the past, I might show a different image, the box of the 3D5 cents, right? Where um, the majority of society self-accept and impose the 3D5 cents aspect of society, right? And so a lot of people, like I've said, get outraged, but they're not willing to go beyond and look vertically. So from a multi-dimensional level, they look par like linearly from side to side, looking for the solution in the 3D, five cents, when this is all known. Uh, this is the threat, okay? Because we see through all the stuff, all right? You discern. So what I've said there is that just really observe, we know that there's no will to solve this, all right? the actual solutions are banned. <laughs> so there's a empowerment of this in the reality. Does that make sense? So the lack of will to solve actually offers us data. Okay? As I said earlier on, um, just because it's not what we, you or I would do, right? don't, don't underestimate um, the beings that have multi awareness make accidents. What if you accept that what happens is deliberate and a name, and what does it prevent? Okay, and I've used me as an example, right? Because I don't think I was meant to find all this information and stuff. Whether it would just be my will to get through and giving it away, the three D five cents society sort of stuff, right? That was my savior. Non attachment to materialism, right? Because that's the trap most people get into, okay? So, just contemplate this, all right? Uh, and the metaphor I've had with my allies, it's like walking a bit of a tightrope because um, there's also like, uh, you can trigger people and then they activate certain um, self-accepted awarenesses and they can come back and get you. So, even prevent... Even, you know, you being you and you break out, uh, there can be aspects in this that are targeting you, right? And obviously, 
my attitude on this, right, is this is all needed for confirmation that we are the threat, okay? So um, the level of investment and prevention is a reflection of uh, potentials, right? So the malnutrition and all this sort of stuff, um, the uncertainty with the money and all that um, discord, all right? Which I'll get to in a sec, okay? But just contemplate this, all right? Because my attitude is once you become aware of the reality, um, you have the ability to overcome and negate it because you've got how it all works and stuff and the mechanics is very, very hard to find out. But I'm hoping this is just an easy expression for you to contemplate and think about this. And this is why it's so important to heal and know yourself. Like I've done 10 years of hard healing and going every sort of situation, even if they're toxic or whatever. And I know I've healed a lot of healers and stuff by exchanging energy and money because that allows it to be done if they're resistant, okay? Being a guardian of my region and stuff and worldwide and that. Being very thorough and experience is the key to wisdom, okay? And then um, eliminating you as a variable makes what isn't you more obvious, all right? So you don't have doubt and don't have uncertainty. And you can always splice up you if you know you and what's going on to be able to separate these variables and know where they come from, all right? Because some might be from allies, some might be from region, some might be from other places, some might be from the external. Knowing that you got through all this shit and then the next level of shit comes, all right? But my attitude is there's a sweet spot where... Um, Things can affect you, but as I've said in the past, my attitude is I don't try and defend these. I recover quick, and that's where I, I master my body. I master my, my food and nutrition and stuff. I do the healing proactively. I'm not attached to things in society as much as you think. Um, and connection to Earth Mother as well, which is a big variable. I haven't said this, but um, the whole vegan sort of food thing and what's going on is to me it's disconnect from the frequencies of earth mother right that's the big threat so that's why or like like fresh food and animal based food because they've all got a direct connection to earth and you got to get past that perspective relative to trauma and death and stuff i did a show um misconception of death and therefore existence itself which gets into that because um, it's a bit more broad beyond this topic right now and I want to just get through it but that's something to explore and, and be courageous to challenge your perspectives and invest in the concepts and stuff that might challenge you and, and just have it in the back of your algorithm of your perception of um the possibilities of a different path and stuff, right? So I'm just going to move on. So... The metaphor is like... This area is like our sonar still. If you look at dolphins and stuff, um, there is a subtle connection to all those high levels, in my opinion. A lot of people won't know it. They don't have the ability to splice up all the different things, right? But if you, if you are still trying to work that out, I would just invest in these concepts and just have them as all different variables and experience will be able to help you splice them up. Um, they're quite energetically technical sort of perspectives, but uh, from my perspective, if I had this understanding, it would be a lot easier to decode all the, all the variables going on. All right? So this, this comes to sort of another variable that's being mixed in the... Um, into the super, the frequency of the reality and consciousness that we're in. Um, as I was exploring a lot of stuff, I came across a cool documentary of a group called The KLF, and I wasn't sure if I was going to include this in the video, but I dropped it in the, the pit from yesterday that I'm not including. And so I think it's actually valid, right? Because it's 
another variable that's mixed into the soup of chaos 19 okay and it's a variable that's been employed to us and it could be an influence and I, I could have saved it for another influence show uh, I was even thinking of doing this as an influence show but I think the greater scales with all the um, uh, the bigger scale sort of stuff relative to the stellar activation cycle and the Ashiana stuff that fits very well because it's just another freaking aspect of the frackery going on all right so I came across this the KLF I didn't really know that much when I was growing up uh, late 80s and early 90s I was only like going through my teens and and um, very early on and very naive and uh, back before the internet and all mobile phones and stuff like that but they they did very well and I didn't understand I mean I never had any awareness of their purpose or their aims and stuff like that but so but I do remember their music and liked it and it was interesting at the time it's different to the dance music I listen to now but um, yeah it's it popped up so let's see and it was very very interesting because right? what their aims were were weren't success right their aims were to disrupt the music establishment all right and um, employ discordianism right to mass awake people and stuff right um, their aims were they did they had Dilligaf, they didn't give a shit and they just decided to make music one day out of an expression of their discordian art all right and they freaking <laughs> rocked it <laughs> and they had huge success and it wasn't their aims all right and it was like this big freaking um byproduct of not giving not having a target or an agenda and uh, the outcome was not what they expected it's really interesting so what I what I want to do is just offer it um, if you can focus focus on um, their pathway to getting to the music and discordianism and how they really felt all right because uh, they burnt a million pounds back in the mid 90s and they they're asking people why did we do it and um, in many respects they were ahead of their time because back then it was very, very locked down, all right? It created a lot of discordianism and they got a lot of polarity against them and stuff, all right? So, so what I'll do is I'll offer the clip and just really focus on the discordian aspect, all right? Because what I realized is um, it's sort of an attitude to things, in an effort to do stuff to stimulate change and they did it to the establishment and what I'm getting at is discordianism is an aspect that's um, employed against us in the community right and there's agents of discordianism and agents of chaos all right that um, employ that tactic to uh, um, distort the perceptions in people and leave people not knowing what to do it's, it's actually very interesting so what I'll do is I'll leave it here and let you see that and see you on the other side all right okay everybody lie down on the floor and keep calm the biggest selling single band in the world this year is the KLF. Brand new number one is the KLF. The ladies look up, the smoke look up, the sound will go louder. What time is love? It was the best intro record you'd ever hear in your life. We wanted to dump the whole history of pop music and starting again by just sampling things and building things up like that. In those days, the idea of taking somebody else's song, not only was it somebody else's song, it was the Beatles and ABBA. Just nicked whatever they liked. They were going to get into trouble for that. That's not necessarily a good enough reason for not doing anything. They were the biggest pop band at that time. I machine gunned the audience with blanks, and that was our exit from the music business. We got a phone call saying they were deleting everything and that was it. No downloads, 
No tours, no festival gigs. They deliberately cut off millions of pounds of revenue. There's a much, much darker side to it all. I can't talk about any of these things. I'm not in a position to. I couldn't even start to. That whole thing of us being conceptual artists got completely out of control. These other ones do more and more extreme things. The KLF, who've pulled a string of bizarre media stunts, which have had everyone scratching their heads. They're not known for the guys that did 3 a.m. Eternal. They're known as those guys that burnt the money. We wanted the money, but we wanted to burn it more. They weren't going to give people what they wanted. They were going to give them what they would never forget. They could not and would not be stopped. This is what KLF is about. When they had an idea, they were going to do it. Success doesn't necessarily come from doing things right. The spectacle, the drama, it was all about confrontation. It was, it, everything was a challenge. The Justified Ancients of Moo Moo are the band everyone is talking about. But who on earth are they? Where did the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo come from? The Justified Ancients of Moo Moo were one of the various warring imaginary cults that were mentioned in the Illuminatus trilogy. A fiction had infected Bill's consciousness and life. Before Sweden, before Big in Japan, and before all these things, Bill had had his mind blown by a book called the Illuminatus Trilogy. And this book was kind of like the sacred text of an underground 1960s religion called Discordianism. Discordianism goes back to a meeting between two friends in the 1950s in a bowling alley. This was Greg Hill and Kerry Thornley, and they used to meet to drink beer and try and work out why the world didn't make any sense. And we were uh, discussing uh, philosophy, and we were talking about order and chaos. My theory was that order emerged from chaos. Greg's theory was that order was projected on the universe, that it didn't exist at all. And I said, well, you know, what we need is not so much an explanation for order, but what the world needs is an explanation for chaos. At that point, we decided to start a religion, and thus Discordianism was born. I'm interested in finding some technique by which great masses of people can be broken out of their authoritarian conditioning all at once. A lot of what the Discordians did was called Operation Mindfuck. They would write letters to magazines with completely ludicrous positions in. There are the same number of letters in Lincoln as there are in Kennedy. And both were assassinated by men with middle names and replaced by Johnsons. The idea was to spread so much chaos and confusion that nobody would know what on earth was true. And this was the tradition that Bill and Jimmy picked up on. Well, we nicked a lot of stuff, obviously, from Illuminati. It was just there, waiting to be used. They discovered Discordianism through the core text of that religion, which was the Illuminatus trilogy. The Illuminatus books were a total send-up of sci-fi and conspiracy fiction. They weaved their way through all kinds of surreal fantasies and conspiracies. I, Markov Cheney, discovered another hidden joke in my name. Ken Campbell, already a well-established author and director, started an outfit specifically to perform a freewheeling adaptation of the novels. And Santana's troops losing all fear because they was high on Rosa Maria. The plays were a great success, despite the fact that the first performance lasted 12 hours. I went along there to find out what the Illuminati are. But there may be the people behind the scenes who are really running things. I mean, it would seem a bit unlikely that, that Nixon was running things exactly, you know what I mean? By a strange coincidence, the stage manager of the Illuminatus production was a young Bill Drummond. Bill thought it might be a good idea if he actually read 
the books that it was based upon. By the time he got to halfway through the first book, he'd already read enough. Ken Campbell sent him out for a tube of Aldite, and Bill never came back. He wanted to actually go out into the world and be this book. Taking on the name Justified Ancient of Moo Moo meant they were taking on the name Forces of Chaos who are at war with the music industry. So that was right there at the start. Last year, we realised the time had come in the history of pop music where anybody, well, we, we thought anybody, anybody could have a number one. We could just reach out and grab it. So we thought we'd have one. We went into the studio on a Monday thinking we were going to make a house track, you know, regular underground dance house track using a bit of the Doctor Who theme tune. We realised it was in triplet time, and you can't have house tracks in triplet time. And the only beat that we'd work with it was the glitter beat. That track took itself over, really. It's like an out of control lorry. And we just went for the lowest common denominator. A couple of days into it, we realised how terrible it was. By Tuesday evening, we realised we had a number one. And we have a brand new number one on top of the box this week. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's a car. Here the Time Lords. The current number one song on the pop charts this week is allegedly the brainchild of an American police car called Ford Time Lord. He sits in the studio and tells us what he wants and we actually do it for him. The song was uh, all my idea and we made a great record. My earliest memory was wanting to be on top of the pops. Then finally I was on and I was at number one. Best thing. It only lasted for a week, then it was all over. It just dissipated in front of us. I think most people thought that it was just stupid records that everybody hated, which, you know, on one level, it was, you know. Doctor and the TARDIS had shown how easy it was to have a number one. All you need to get to number one is this pile of junk. Get three bits of other songs and stick them together with a bit of sellotape. So the next step was to lift the curtain and show everyone else how to do it. Some of these crop circles were the work of an underground dance band, the KLF, who've pulled a string of bizarre media stunts which have had everyone scratching their heads. The idea was to spread so much chaos and confusion that nobody would know what on earth was true. So where did the idea come from? Oh, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> a big brooms. Put a plank across the bottom of the room, tape it all up, and the whole thing got completely out of hand in our heads. And when they asked us, well, did you do it? I had to say, well, I don't know. set out at all to be this global, international, multi-successful dance, pop, crossover, whatever it was. That was never part of the game plan.
welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that. It's pretty cool, right? KLF. Um, the documentary is Who Killed the KLF? And they just deleted all their records and their source and stuff and went to ground and disappeared for 20 years or whatever. And then they released the book a few years ago and stuff. But to be able to let go of the money and stuff and let go of the fame and all the benefits and all that, It's very amazing, right? Very few people could do it. Like, I don't brag about it or know anything. I don't know if I'd freaking be able to do that in that moment, but I use the metaphor of my awakening is when I had choice of money and love, and I chose love, and that was the unknown door for my awakening, all right? So in many respects, I've been able to walk away from money and, and speak my truth on that because it's not about the money. It's about... Um, revealing aspects of people and stuff or um, there's something better on the other side all right it's white wizard moment sort of things all right so I can appreciate what they did and but to do it on the scale and that and the volumes and um, it's just the commitment on a level that very few have and very few understand so now watching in hindsight that all right, 30 years later, I can appreciate it, but they were just miles ahead of their curve, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an image, right? So I sort of did this, all right? So if we do the scale of, scale of Discord and the errors, and so I've done one of KLF, right? So imagine they popped in and they did all this stuff and created all this inertia, and then they just disappeared, all right? So I've just done a metaphor of the societal one, all right? That's particularly aimed at the community of awareness and stuff, all right? So, yeah, just have a read. It's there, all right? Maybe pause it. So, what I feel, all right? This Gordian has always been a weapon that's used against the awareness community, all right? And most spiritual people are very pure, good people, kind-hearted, want the best for everyone and stuff. Um, non-violent and all that sort of stuff and these invading forces do not give a shit right um, like there's no uh, 9 to 5 thing of defending yourself right there's no like lunch break where everyone pulls it, puts their tools down and has a break and everyone can eat their lunch and then go back at whatever side they're on and whatever energy they're holding and whatever role they've got and because the game is multi-dimensional and we're not really the majority of humanity are self-accepting the limits right so what i'm offering is there's chaos 19 inserted into our prefrontal cortex and stuff of a variable in society that there's no will of society itself to resolve it actually wants it there and just say there's a variable uh, to, to go at us plus discordianism is being um, done, right, <laughs> to distort everything, right, so just imagine the, the variable chaos 19 is putting us off our game and being able to sense truth and stuff where we used to be better back here and stuff, and the information is crappier, like I said in the leadership video, right, the algorithm's a lot worse, social media's got a lot more stronger in those respects, the self-censorship has been implemented and most people aren't or really authentic or truthful, um, unfortunately, okay? A lot of people have agendas and stuff. So what I'm just inviting is raise your discernment level, all right? Just really go and understand what discording, like discord is, all right? It's a disharmony effect, basically. So people inserting information into reality, all right? You can probably call them discord agents. And what I've said is, like, most of the species here, they're part of the Phantom Matrix sort of shit, and their their aims are in partnership with that. And humanity have a Stockholm Syndrome of gravitating to their perpetrators because um, those perpetrators, say, in the Babylon Massacre, inserted themselves as um, the caretakers of that to create the discord, so when the stellar activation cycle kicked in, um, we'd be all set up for failure, for that 
outcome, right? So if I go back to the other image I've shown earlier, so I'm not trying to say too much about me and all that sort of stuff, but I'm just saying my role and what I've done and what I've achieved, all right? And despite all that, instinctively many of us and I'm using me as a metaphor to help you all probably go from a passive state to an active state of realizing what you've done innately, despite all this crap, all right? It hasn't been enough, okay? So, all the GSF recordings and missions and stuff, um, I did say it was related to pole shift, but like pole flip, but that was just one aspect of it, right? And I'm not getting into it all. I pretty much freaking don't understand it all anyway. I just go and do what I do. Don't need to know. Because like the metaphor of when I do my healings and stuff is, like once I get to know all this stuff, I don't need to know all the details. It's just about resolving it and moving on and being ready for the next thing, all right? Which is quite ironic with me because I'm an information person, so it's... A, it's a, it's me effing with myself in my own way, all right? <laughs> it's just funny. Um, yeah, but it's harmonic because it's sort of the opposite of how I work in that state. So, yeah, it's just really interesting, all right? So, I showed this earlier on. So I hope you get a few more data points for your algorithm in this. All right? I'm not wanting to make it too long. Uh, I, whatever you've explored with me has helped you expand your algorithms of your perceptions and starting to see through the bullshit right? and then holding your own and uh, whatever's going on in society is amping you up not bottling you down right? this sort of stuff unfortunately it's the nature of this reality earth isn't a tough earth isn't an easy holiday right uh, you got to be pretty badass to be here, all right, obviously. And then to be aware in it, it's a huge privilege and honor, all right. Um, just imagine the investment that's gone into you to be here and to even get to this stuff, all right. So, um, yeah, I'm going to round it out. There's probably stuff I'm going to forget, but um, very interesting, isn't it? Chaos 19. Uh, I wasn't actually probably going to put the our left stuff but I think it's uh, for those of you hardcore that do the effort um, that are on a mission for self mastery and as I said there's no shortcut to self mastery Malcolm Gladwell and 10,000 hours in his outliers book right um, I was going to do there's no shortcut to self mastery sort of show the third of the um, One's after the stoicism and the um, passion, all right? But I thought I'd bring this forward because I don't want to sit on this without sharing it. <laughs> There's a vulnerability there. So once I get it, it's I get it out and then it's safe, all right? So thank you for being here. I hope you get something from this. Um, I'm going to probably explore certain aspects of what I offered here in a far more detail in other times. I am brewing another recalibration to our new energetic reality show with some variables that have gone on relative to being able to splice these sort of things up. But um, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your journey. And if you get something from it and expand your um, appreciation of what's going on, I, I know having this algorithm code, right? And holding it in you um, and processing it. Just to say in the crap out of me, I always say that, but um, I think you'll start developing less tolerance for people out there and seeing through their bullshit and their angles and stuff like that. And um, your body technology will start revealing a lot and um, just, just see how it feels and appreciate it and honor it and trust your gut and your instincts all right so thank you uh interesting times all right i hope you're doing well and i hope this information helps enhance your existence and get through a lot of stuff and 
defend against stuff. All right. So thank you. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love, guys. Andre out. Take my hand and fly away with me Over mountains and seas Far away from the pain to a place where we're all free As we fly together, you and me We will build a new world Still believe in the love I know that we will be John Lilly once put it this way, there are no limits at all to the human mind whatsoever, except those we impose on ourselves because of our beliefs. And those limits are also beliefs to be transcended. And that's a view that suggests that the possibilities of human transformation are virtually infinite that we have no way of knowing the outer horizon of what it means to be human. And really, to understand all this, everything, you have to go very, very deep in, into uh, a study of uh, history, consciousness, neurophysiology, everything. You have, really to be, you have to be the supreme eclectic type of uh, leaning, and you really have to be wanting to know who you are and, and what everything's about. And the thing that you'll find when you go to sacred sites, if you're very humble about it, is that you are on a personal journey, and the sacred site will respond to you in a way that is appropriate only to you. The information is always what you are searching for, and it's the intent you give uh, that energy that defines whether it is used for right action or not. And it is inside these sacred spaces that you will be reminded that you are a god, that you are a bright star. So what you're trying to do is move through 
The course without ricocheting off walls or creating karma. You're trying to slide through things smoothly. How do you do that? It's called flowing. There's a technique that you can do that will allow you to touch some part of your inner being that has more knowledge than your conscious state does.